Uh, Kelly Animal Birchfield here, uh, philosopher in chief of the Lawn Chair Philosophy Foundation. It's 12:30 in the morning on Wednesday, February 22nd, and we're going to go over what we should have gone over in our Husserl seminar last week, discussing this the first part of part two of Husserl's formal and transcendental logic. Uh, last week, our good philosopal Mayuki, um, who has been uh, helping us explicate some 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 meaning some sense out of this out of this book uh, she couldn't make it uh no one else showed up either so i took myself a break and decided i would i would turn um uh, an exegesis over uh, what we ought to have gone over into a little little educational advertisement educational in the sense that well we'll be going over some educational content but also i i hope to to educate you all on all the possible ways you might study with us here at the lawn chair philosophy foundation if you are interested uh in in what i'm covering in this video today you are more than welcome to join us in our current seminar or to join our study group uh, to gain access to previous recordings and uh, video study guides as well as supplementary material uh, as, and primary reading material um, and, and if you'd really like you may reach out about one-on-one -on -one philosophical consultation for absolutely free me uh, or donovan or someone else from our team of professional academic philosophers uh, will design a course of study um, with your needs and interests in mind. Um, so if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this rule, you hit me up. You hit me up and we will set set up something for you. We're all about making academic philosophy more accessible and what's more accessible than having an academic philosopher right there at your disposal. So anyways, let's dig into this book. Uh, a main objective of this whole book is to to establish the possibility of logic as a mathesis universalis, an all-encompassing uh, science of all science. Um, and uh, in order to, to set that up in the, in the first section, Husserl wants us to understand the double sense of logic. It's, it's, it's two-sidedness. Uh, it's apophantic, purely analytic side, and its ontological, purely formal ontological side. So on the apophantic side of things, um, logic deals with the formation of propositions, of making posits, uh, specifically predicated judgments, um, with the aim of creating categories. Um, those categories we might see in everyday life co-intended uh this is a book and i understand this to be a book in the sense that i'm holding it i can read from it i'm having a very physical experience of it but this is a concept of a book and how we might rightly correctly apply it to things in the world um well it's to do with categoralia uh, so with formal apophantic logic we can um analyze just propositions in and of themselves um, and, and look for contradictions or non-contradictions. Uh, we don't have to worry about truth in this purely analytic apophantic realm, just looking at what propositions fit well together to form categories, um, which propositions don't fit well together and might need to, to, to draw lines between different categories of things. We're not looking at individual objects. We're not reflecting on specifically the process, the mental processes of making posits and judgments. We're just absorbed in the process of making judgments about specifically propositions. Our range, our focus is very narrow here. Uh, and truth doesn't really come into play here uh, because truth, according to Husserl, has to do with adequation. Um, so once we bring in questions of truth, those are higher ordered questions, and uh, in order to make sense of truth, we need this other aspect of science or uh, logic, especially if it's going to be the science of all science. Um, this this formal ontological realm, this realm of the any object whatsoever, and uh, Husserl wants to say that once logic uh, starts thinking about 
whether the judgments made in, on the apophantic side are correct, we need to reference um, some evidence. Uh, we need to look at the object about which there was a judgment, uh, the context uh, out of which the object arose, and how adequately uh, the judgment, the positing, um, aligns or, 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 uh, with what is given. Not in a corresponding way, um, not necessarily in a representational way, but in a merely does, does this adequately hold? Um, is this potential belief, or at least this supposition, that's how we're taking uh, our positings, our judgments here, whenever we're just merely formal, these posits are taken as um, uh, suppositions and to address even the possibility of a sub supposition being true, we need to delineate this field of objective being um, against which we might weigh our, our judgments. Um, so we can have pure apophantic logic without a formal ontology, but we need the two hand in hand in order for uh, logic to realize itself as a math thesis universalis. Um, so, so after setting up the double sense of logic, its apophantic side, uh, which is not dependent on um, formal ontology, and the formal ontology side, which is dependent on the, uh, the apophantic side to, to delineate the rules of operation, we might say, um, uh, and and the, the 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 marriage we need between the two in order to establish the possibility of logic being a uh, universal uh, mathesis universalis an all encompassing science of science. Uh, we begin in section two, uh, fleshing out our judgments, um, seeping into the material realm in order to isolate the purely apophantic realm and pure ontology, we put out of play uh, concerns about particular objects. Um, we put out of play uh, a reflection on uh, judgments as they pertain to the world. Um, simpliciter as, ex as existing. Um, but we, we, we want to look at this Mathesis Universalis on the move in, in real life um, and at play. Um, so, so we want to look at the material, that about which uh, things might be judged. Well, whose rule wants to put a restrictor plate on this race car before we go round and round this circle? Let me say, he does not want us to fall into any sort of psychologism. So we don't want to think about the material of judgments uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that restricts us to um, discussing uh, spatio-temporal reality uh, of, of, of external material reality, and we don't want to restrict ourselves to uh, talk of uh, internal properties that condition the possibility for assigning um, value to material things that are just existing in and of themselves. Um, we want to avoid that, that conversation of the in and of itself. Um, that Husserl uh, claims Descartes put into motion with his, um, his cogito, and which Kant really picked up on and, and, and was singing about until the cows came home. Cows never came home. He's still singing about it. He's dead. He's still singing about it. And who's real is still singing about it, even though he's dead. And here I am talking about it with you all here today. <laughs> so we don't want to restrict the material. Um, we might judge about things that we sense to be material, physical things that have the mark of space, space and time. And, um, it might be involved in, in sense perception. However, um, if we look at 
the, the general form of all evidence, we see that not all matter is real. Um, what matters to us, what makes sense to us, is all, uh, can, we can include under that, that category irreal objects. So the nature of irreal objects uh, motivates Husserl to call, to, to call us to pause for a bit. So I want to begin, not in section 55, where this new section, or this new chapter starts. I want to, I want to start in, in the middle of section 56, the reproach of psychologism cast at every consideration of logical formations that is directed to the subjective. Husserl writes, the judgments of which logic speaks in its laws are not the mental judgment processes, the judgings. The truths are not the mental evidence processes. The proofs are not the subjective psychic provings and so forth. And Husserl wants to draw our attention to, to, to what he claimed in the first part and, and that logic is concerned with propositions, suppositions, judgments um uh not again this judgment process thought of psychologically um thought of as brain waves thought of as um you know reactions or affections or feelings um you know logic is about propositions now those propositions are taken to be judgments they are things that we make that we create um, but the science of logic itself should be separated from psychology here. It's an important um, distinction to make. He goes on in the next page. Um, no one would designate as the province of natural science the psychic processes of experiencing nature and thinking about it rather than nature itself. Here the psychologistic temptations to which recent logic had yielded almost universally did not exist. And according to all this, every thematizing of the subject seems to be excluded for logic, as it is for every other objective science, except human and animal psychology. The subjective belongs in the province, not of logic, but of psychology. Um, so whenever we are looking at this two-sidedness of the inquiry of logic, um, we do, of course, want to take into consideration how it is our um, um, subjective processes of making sense of the world paves the way for the emergence of uh, the practice of, of logic itself. Um, and the um psychic process of dealing with evidence not necessarily constituting all by itself evidence but dealing with evidence um will come into play in establishing the rules of of the game for analyzing logical evidence it's propositions how they relate to each other um but again we don't want to reduce uh logic to the actual observation of judgments again that that is that, that is psychological um he goes on to say in, in the next section our main concern here is the equating of the formations produced by judging with phenomena appearing in internal experience so that's what we're adding to to the mix um from what we gathered in last semester's study. So now we're bringing these propositions uh, into conversation with the phenomena appearing in eternal experience. Phenomena is going to be very vague. Um, uh, so let's, let's continue on. This equating is based on their making their appearance internally in the act consciousness itself. Thus concepts, judgments, Arguments, proofs, theories would be psychic occurrences and logic would be, as John Stuart Mill says, it is a part or branch of psychology. This highly plausible conce uh, conception is 
logical psychologism. Then he goes on to say, in opposition to this, we say, there is an original evidence that in repeated acts, which are quite alike or else similar, the produced judgments, arguments, and so forth are not merely quite alike or similar, but numerically, identically the same judgments, arguments, and the like. So Mahusra will say that we do produce judgments and propositions. They are not products of our own imaginations. They're not products of our observations and any induction that might be motivated by our observations and comparing and contrasting them. Um, judgments are numerically identical they are the same they might be reactivated um, within the same psyche and they come up exactly the same unlike memories uh, whenever we remember something we reactivate that original experience and bring it to the fore of our consciousness but we bring it into the present in the context of the present um, brings new insight, new shape to that memory. But judgments are different. When we act, reactivate judgments, they reappear exactly the same as they did whenever we first had them. Um, and whenever we propose a proposition to uh, a community of logicians, and they can take that judgment on upon themselves and, ex and, and it's the same exact judgment. This rule wants to point in, hone in on the um, e real, i r r e a l nature of um, of these judgments, uh, judgments proper, proposition. Um, so uh, yes. So again, we do produce judgments, but. Um, not in the way that uh, ordinary phenomena appear um, in, etern in, in e internal experience. They uh, appear alongside phenomena and we can thematize them and they might be phenomenon for us, um, which we might reflect upon in some imminent moment. However, um, they do not bear the mark of um internal time they do not bear the mark of external time objective time they do not bear the mark of sense experience uh, they like numbers are irreal there's something ideal about uh logical formations okay so let's bear that in mind so the evidence of ideal objects analogous to that of individual objects is the next section section 58 let's take a look at poo right here it says the evidence of irreal objects objects that are ideal in the broadest sense is in its effect quite analogous to the evidence of ordinary so-called internal and external experience which alone on no other grounds than prejudice is commonly thought capable of of affecting an original objectification. The identity and therefore the objectivity of something ideal can be directly seen with the same originality as the identity of an object of experience in the usual sense. In repeated experiences before any repetition, the continuous modification of the momentary perception and retention and protension, or that is in, in um, memory, and expectation then in possible recollections repeatable at will there comes about with their synthesis the consciousness of the same moreover as an experience of the self sameness the possibility of such original identification belongs as essential correlate to the sense of every object of experience in the usual and pregnant sense a sense determined to the effect that experience is an evident seizing upon and having of either an imminent or a real individual datum itself. In just the same fashion, we say there belongs to the sense of an irreal object, the possibility 
of its identification on the basis of its own manners of being itself seized upon and had understood, we, should, we, might, we might say. Uh, actually, the effect of this identification is like that of an experience, a mediated dis experience. He uses erfahrung here. Um, that is a, a, a experience of uh, external reality or, or something concrete. Except that an irreal object is not individuated in consequence of a temporality belonging to its originality. Um, so what belongs to original experiences of things of sense or temporality, uh, even things of the imagination, they, they, they might appear. Well, actually, that's a bad example. <laughs> we'll just say of memories. We might recall that original experience, and even though uh, we are in a new original moment, recalling that original experience, um, we, we can recognize some sameness involved there, but it's through the mark of time that we're able to identify sameness through difference. Uh, it's, it's through memory um, and expectation as well. Um, it's through time consciousness that we are able to um, make sense of identity of any object whatsoever. Um, any sense object whatsoever, any concrete uh, thing whatsoever. Sorry, any irreal object. Well, we still experience, we still apprehend them and experience them in their own way amidst the flow of time. So I guess we still do need time to make sense of these objects, but the, 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 our judgments, our propositions, our arguments, they do not bear the mark of time. Uh, we don't need memory in order to make sense of them. Um, yeah, because they remain, in order to, to make sense of their identity, because they remain the same throughout all contexts, and uh, whether within your own lifespan, your own recollection, or whether they are in somebody else's head, somebody else being on their own little subjective wavelength there in their timeline here. So um, there's something special uh, happening with these irreal objects, uh, the type of evidence uh, through which they appear is slightly different. Of course, they, they will, will experience everything through time, um, but um, time itself does not predicate the essence of, um, or predicate the possibility of understanding the essence of these Euro objects. Um, so he goes on in the next section, a universal characterization of evidence as the giving of something itself. Let no one upbraid us with the renowned evidence of internal perception. As an instance counter to these statements, for internal perceptions giving of its eminent per, uh, percept itself, about this we shall have more to say. Of course, Visceral always has more to say. Is by itself alone the giving of something itself, which is only a preliminary to an object. It is not the giving of something itself, which is an object in the proper sense. Perception alone is never a full objectivating performance if we understand such a performance to be indeed the seizing upon an object itself. We accept internal perception as a seizing upon an object itself only because we are tacitly taking into account possible recollection, repeatable at will, when actualized. Recollection gives for the first time original certainty of the being of a subjective object in the full sense, a so-called psychic datum, as something acquired uh, originaliter and identifiable at will, something to which one can always go back again, and which one can recognize in a, react in, in a reactivation as the, the self-same. Naturally, a concomitant intentional relation to such a synthesis of recognition plays a similar role in the case of each external objectivity, which is by no means to say that it makes up the full performance affected by external experience. 
Here we go. Evidence, as has already become apparent to us by the above explanations, designates that performance on the part of intentionality which consists in the giving of something itself. More precisely, it is the universal preeminent form of intentionality, of consciousness, of something in which there is consciousness of the intended to objective affair and the mode itself seized upon, itself seen. Dot, dot, dot. We can also say that it is the primal consciousness I am seizing upon itself originaliter, as contrasted with seizing upon it as an image or as some other intuitional or empty for meaning. Still, we must immediately point out here that evidence has different modes of originality. So, all evidence is original. There is an original presentation of a thing um, given to for whatever preposition you want to choose, consciousness. Um, so in order for something to count as uh, evidentially there, it must be there in some way, shape, or form, whether the object that sits before us is existent whether it is imaginary, whether it is real, irreal, whatever. We must apprehend objects originally in, in, in consciousness. However, again, evidence is given in a myriad of ways. It's not just one type of evidence. There's one type of um, doxic certainty, an er doxa, that, that there is always something available to consciousness. Consciousness is always intentional. Um, consciousness is always directed towards something. Um, and of that we can be certain. Um, but we can we can modify that certainty of givenness. Um, we can doubt, we can question, we can desire, we can wish. Um, and those modes of attending those objects, well, it, it, it shifts the evidence, it shifts the appearance, how that object is given. And when it comes to the type of object that we have, uh, well, different types of objects are situated in their own regions of being, their own ontologies. Um, so there's something about, um, there's something about irreal objects that require a certain type of evidence. It'll be originary evidence, all evidence is, but let's take a closer look at what differentiates irreal evidence from regular evidence, or at least that might be the aim. We might not get that far. The section that we end with will be uh, 61, evidence in general in the function pertaining to all objects, real and irreal as synthetic unities. We might have to wait uh, uh, to get uh, more refined uh, distinctions about the nature of evidence. So you're just going to have to join us for that. Uh, but in, in the meanwhile, let's let's keep let's keep going. Uh, we're after a a process of renewal and reactivation here. All evidence must be um, renewable. Re they must we must be able to reactivate that evidence. Um, so let's let's look uh, let's look a little bit closer. Uh, still, we must immediately point out here that evidence has different modes of originality. The primitive mode of the giving of something itself is perception, direct perception. Uh, again, and we can modify uh, perception. The being with is for me as percipient, consciously, I now being with. I myself with the perceived itself and intentionally modified and more complicated mode of the giving of something itself is the memory that does not emerge emptily but on the contrary actualizes itself again clear recollection so already with memory we have a different sort of presentation of evidence um, so we have the primitive mode something is given originally we can modify what is given originally via memory um, and reactivate something and bring it back to the fore. Um, are the ways of modifying our perception. Um, we can do so um, th 
through fantasy, through th th free free variation of fantasy. Uh, in fact, uh, Husserl's whole phenomenological method uh, uh, rests on on that possibility of, of the of the taking as if. And in fact, whenever we are engaged in uh, uh, taking things on thematically with a theoretical attitude, we, may, we, uh, we take our judgments to be merely suppositions, we have modified uh, an original evidence. Um, it, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue now. Um, by its own phenomenological composition, clear recollection is intrinsically a reproductive consciousness, a consciousness of the object itself as my past object. Um, so I'm reproducing, reawakening, reestablishing, um, presenting again, not representing in a model sense that we see in traditional system philosophies, but a representation of what once was presented. Um, and with which I am now again with it again with our side with itself let us note here because we might otherwise be misled can't have that that the modification of itself giving as perception and recollection plays very different roles for real and irreal objectivities respectively this is connected with the circumstance that the latter have no temporal loci to bind them uh, individuatingly they're not individuated via time and memory. They just are individuated already. Uh, merely because of an essentially possible alteration of attitude or focus, any clear, explicit recollection of an ideal species changes into a perception of it, something naturally excluded in the case of temporally uh, individuated objects. Um, so let's continue we are not opposing our universal characterization of evidence to the usual one as though ours were a new theory an attractive interpretation which is yet to be tested who knows how perhaps in the end even by experiments on thinking rather we are presenting it as an evidence attained at a higher level by a phenomenological explication of any experience and of any actually exercised insight. This higher evidence in turn can be itself explicated and understood in respect of its effect only by means of an evidence belonging to a third level. And so in infinitum, only in seeing can I bring out what is truly present in a seeing. I must make a seeing explication of the proper essence of seeing. So we need to have a little change of attitude. Uh, we need to undertake the critical attitude in order to access um, these irreal evidences, or specifically these judgment evidences. Um, so again, uh, whenever we're uh, reflecting on, or sorry, whenever we are taking on uh, a logical science, we're already engaged in a critical attitude where we're making things thematic. Um, we are making propositions thematic in uh, um, uh, logic, um, but, but in order to, to get a sense for the, the type of evidence uh, going on there, uh, we want to look at this irreal. Uh, so so we, um, we're creating higher order judgments. We can only access um, that realm of evidence through higher ordered phenomenological reflection. According to Husserl, of course, we're going to need his method in order to truly see. Um, uh, but he goes on. Precisely because it gives its objective affair as the affair itself. Any consciousness that gives something itself can establish rightness, correctness for another consciousness. And it does so as we had occasion to describe in the form of synthetic adequation to the affairs themselves. Again, that synthetic adequation being uh, whenever we um, are judging our propositions, pardon me, <laughs> for, um, for an adequation to the state of affairs to which they attend. Um, 
or else it establishes incorrectness in the form of inadequation as the evidentness of nullity. Um, so that that being said, we need we need this higher ordered reflection on the nature of formal ontology, the region of being of anything whatsoever, uh, to establish um, a way of achieving uh, proper evidence uh, through which these propositions uh, reveal themselves in, in their full sense, or at least uh, in their full logical sense within the sphere, within the narrow sphere of logic. Um, um, yes, yes, yes. Um, so anyways, thus the givings of things themselves are the acts producing evident legitimacy or rightness. They are creative primal institutings of rightness. The truth of truth as correctness, precisely because for the objectivities themselves as existing for us, they are the originally consti uh, constitutive acts, originally uh, institutive of sense and being, in like fashion, original inadequations as givings of nullity itself are primal institutings of falsity, of wrongness, as incorrectness. They constitute not objectivity simpliciter, that is, existing objectivity, but rather on the basis of supposed or meant objectivity cancellation of that meaning, that is, its non-being. Uh, so any object in general is, well, what is meant? And not necessarily, um, uh, uh, we're not talking about an existing objectivity here, but a possible objectivity. Um, whenever we are engaged in, in formal ontology. Uh, so we need to, to take into consideration this, this very general um, abstract uh, constitution of the evidence of um, irreal objects. They aren't uh, constituted uh, via sense perception. Uh, we, in fact, must actively change our attitudes, modify that sense perception, um, uh, refocus our attention in a critical way, um, and look towards higher ordered um, realms in order to true in order for these propositions to reveal themselves to us. I, I looked at a little note on page 161. And we're looking at section 60. There's a little bit of Spinoza in here. Uh, he, he, he writes, well, actually, I, I skipped a bunch uh, uh, before getting to Spinoza. So let me, let me read here. Thus, evidence is a universal mode of intentionality related to the whole life of consciousness. Thanks to evidence, the life of consciousness has an all-pervasive teleological structure, a pointedness towards reason and even a pervasive tendency towards it, that is, toward the discovery of correctness and toward the canceling of incorrectness. Um, so there is something about human reason uh, that, that uh, lends itself to um, correcting our judgments, correcting our beliefs, um, building a body of knowledge. Um, uh, the, 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 he, he goes on about possible motivations for this, but we're, 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 in terms of science, science understands itself as just wanting to achieve episteme, universal and necessary insight for the sake of universal and necessary insight. Um, we don't need to go into that discussion in, in, in the, the, the history of the concept of reason right here, right now, um, but there's something about the way that we make sense of the world, um, that uh, is, is a constant process of reevaluation. Uh, we want to be right. Um, and uh, anyways, it is not only with respect to this all pervasive teleological function that evidence is a theme for far reaching and difficult investigations. These concern also the universal nature of evidence as a single component of conscious life. And here belongs the property mentioned above, that in every evidential consciousness of an object, an intentional reference to a synthesis of recognition is included. 
They concern furthermore the modes of originality of evidence and their functions, as well as the different regions and categories of objectivities themselves. Category of objectivity and category of evidence are perfect correlates, Husserl, Husserl writes, to every fundamental species of objectivities as intentional unities maintainable throughout an intentional synthesis and ultimately as unities belonging to a possible experience. A fundamental species of experience of evidence corresponds and likewise a fundamental species of intentionality indicated evidential style and the possible enhancement of the perfection of having of the having of an objectivity itself. Shoo, 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 shoo. But here, here we go, here we go, here we go. Thus a great task arises, an infinite task. Uh, the task of exploring all these modes of the evidence in which the objectivity intended to show, uh, to show, in which the objectivity intended to shows itself. Now less and now more perfectly of making understandable the extremely complicated performances fitted together to make a synthetic harmony and always pointed ahead to new ones. So, um, uh, whenever we are looking at actual matters, judgments about actual things, um, in order to um, judge the rightness or wrongness of that judgment, we're not looking at just the supposition, we're looking at uh, its relationship to the evidence. Is that uh, proposition adequate given the evidence that we have and the object which appears through that evidence. Um, so before and in, in, in the first chapter again we were just looking at any object in general and how it is uh, apophantic logic um, uh, whenever it wants to achieve clarity. Uh, that is whenever it wants to do more than merely distinguish itself as a proposition but to um, illuminate it's it's objective status under the light of truth um or perhaps nullity we might sink into the abyss of nullity um we must take into consideration um that that general sort of evidence um so there's there's layers happening here not only um in the case of um any object that we might attend to we need to in logic attend to the state of affairs out of which that object arose, uh, but how it is uh, we are conceptualizing that state of affairs as a general state of affairs. We're, we're harkening back to that categorical synthesis, categorical intuition here. Um, so when it comes to the real objects, um, we need to attend to um, our categorical intuiting, or, or we kind of presume it's happening uh, within logic, we're, we're, because again, we don't want to fall into some psychologism, but we must attend to the general structures of the, of the uh, conditions, the evidential conditions out of which that object appears, uh, if we're going to set up the possibility for establishing truth or falsehood. Uh, uh, adequate uh, knowledge or inadequate knowledge, we'll say. Um, yes, so I said Spinoza. Uh, Spinoza was, was all about objects revealing themselves to uh, pure rationality um, through, through affectation. So, so anyways, the, the, I, I really love this, this um, the, the way that Husserl is writing about um, this evidence and how it how um, it sort of paves the way for this object to reveal itself to us. I think there's a little bit of realism happening in uh, Husserl, um, and I think that is partially evidence to to, to that 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 belief. But I I would need a, a slew of premises to substantiate that claim and, and that's the point of this video we're, we're, we're closing in on the last little section and then hopefully, hopefully that's a good indication of of what's going on in in these little sessions if you want to if you want to join us or or if this is this is all making you go what hey hit me up we can have a discussion 
we're gonna have a discussion about it. Um, so anyways, uh, to declaim from the heights about evidence and the self-confidence of reason is of no avail here. And to stick to tradition, which for motives long forgotten and in any case never clarified, reduces evidence to an insight that is apodic apodictic, absolutely indubitable, and so to speak, absolutely finished in itself. Uh, is to borrow oneself from an understanding of any scientific production. Natural science, for example, must rely on external experience only because external experience is precisely that mode of having of something itself with, which pertains to natural objects. So the natural sciences need their natural evidence and that's fine, but we can't have natural evidence be the sort of evidence um, uh, uh, at play if we want to access irreal objects um, or whether those objects be propositions or arguments or numbers, I don't know, whatever irreal object you're thinking about here. Uh, we're, we're worried about uh, uh, logical objects, but it's a proposition. But anyways, um, yes. Uh, and again, only because imperfect experience is still experience, still a consciousness that is having of something itself, can experience it, uh, adjust itself to experience and correct itself by experience. So, um, uh, evidence, th there's a certain level of doubt that that can emerge with evidence. We cannot doubt that there is evidence before us. Something is always before consciousness. Um, uh, that principle of all principles is something that we, we can't doubt. However, um, when it propositions, um, th there's an inherent falsifiability to them. Um, we must be able to recollect them and reevaluate them. Um, and there, there, there should be the possibility that, hey, we, they might, it might be inadequate given the evidence and given the objects that emerge within that evidence. They, they, these judgments could be incorrect, no matter how often they, they, they have proven themselves to be correct, given our standards of, of reason of and adequate knowledge here in Husserl. Um, but they're, they always could be incorrect, given new evidences that arise. Again, the type of evidence that, that uh, allows irreal objects to emerge for us. So it's going to be specific, but I'm beating a dead horse, I feel like, uh, with that. Um, Anyways, um, onward here, onward here. We gotta go, we gotta go. <laughs> the, um, yes, yes, next page. Uh, all transcendent realistic theories with their arguments leading from the imminent sphere of purely internal experience to an extra psychic trans uh, transcendency are attributable to a blindness to the proper character of external experience. It's a performance that gives us something itself and would otherwise be unavailable to provide a basis for natural scientific theories. So while the natural sciences have their external evidence as evidence, what allows for natural science to be a science in the first place is its use of logic, which need not be tied to natural evidence. Um, uh, so it's not that evidence itself, which is... Um, indubitable, or at least that that evidence taken individually. Uh, evidence as something broad and general, as something that is appearing, well again, that, that we cannot doubt. Um, our, our apodictic certainty is going to come from perception, and that's it. That's it. So now we get to section 61, what we'll end today. Uh, I'll leave you on a cliffhanger evidence in general and the function pertaining to all objects real and irreal as synthetic unities. Returning now to irreal objectivities, particularly those belonging to the sphere of analytic logic, again that's just a purely apophantic side, we recall that in part one we became acquainted with the evidences that in their case and according to their various strata are legitimizing evidences, evidences that give something itself. In the case of the irreal objectivities of each stratum, such evidences 
then are the corresponding experiences and they have the essential property of all experiences or evidences of whatever sort that is to say with the repetition of the subjective like processes with the sequence and synthesis of different experiences of the same they make evidently visible something that is indeed numerically identical and not merely things that are quite alike namely the object which is thus an object experienced many times or as we might say one that makes its appearance many times as a matter of ideal possibility infinitely many times in the domain of consciousness uh, if if one substituted for the ideal objectivity is those temporal occurrences in the life of consciousness uh, in which they make their appearance then to be consistent one would have to do would have to do likewise in the case of data of experience in the usual narrower sense in sense data for example psychic data and the data of internal experience are experienced as an imminent time and thus as intentionally identical data given in the flow of subjective temporal modes and i touched on that earlier but the constitutive that pertains to the identical of external experience is more easily accessible physical objects too make their appearance in the field of consciousness and in respect of what is most general no differently than ideal objects that is to say as intentional unities though in the mode itself given making their appearance in the flow of multiple manners of appearance built upon one another in this making of their appearance with the mental experience processes, they are in a, legit, a legitimate sense, imminent in these, but not in the usual sense, that of real eminence. If one intends to understand what consciousness does, and in particular what evidence does, it, does not, it is not enough here or anywhere else to speak of the directedness of consciousness, particularly of experiencing consciousness to objects and at most to distinguish superficially among internal and external experience ideation and the like the multiplicities of consciousness coming under these headings must be brought to sight in phenomenological reflection and dissected structurally one must then trace them with regard to their synthetic transitions and down to the most elementary structures one must seek out the intentional role or function so these synthetic transitions um, take a sense object for example this book you see it from this angle you see it from that angle you see it from this angle what if I were to slap you across the face with it you would experience it from that different angle the same book appears in each of those experiences um, so we can we can through phenomenological reflection um, grasp the ideal essence the common to that object in all of its um, many appearances through those adumbrations. So past experiences of that uh, object, those original moments synthesize with new moments. But, but, not, but that also in synthesis uh, are these categorical forms. Um, I understand this is a book. Um, these are pages. And, and one ought to read from, from a book and be edified by it or make a point to slap someone across the face with it if you need to. Oh, but anyway, so, so, so this synthetic transition in terms of evidence, there's a lot going on here. Um, there's there's uh, uh, memory helping us to, to unfold um, uh, essence, um, and that's its own type of evidence. Um, sorry let's let's get back to, 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 to the irreal as well i go off on tangents my goodness i can't think in a straight line whatsoever um one must make it understood how in the eminence of the multiplicities of mental processes or in the eminence of the changing mode of appearance occurring in these multiplicities of their being directed to and that to which they are directed are made and one must also make it understood wherein now inside the sphere of vision belonging to the synthetic experience itself the transcendent object consists as the identical pole imminent in the single mental processes and yet transcending them by virtue of having an identity that surpasses them it is a giving of something itself 
and yet a giving of something itself that is transcendent and at first indeterminately itself given identical pole, which subsequently displays itself in its likewise ideally identical determinations throughout the giving of itself, a giving that, be, that can be continued in the synthetic form explication. Aha, so it is through further explications uh, that we can um, we can identify this uh, identity that surpasses all of the individual insta instantiations of that identity. Um, and it is, again, through that higher ordered explication that we're going to access the type of evidence that we need um, to, to have <laughs> uh, irreal determinations, the giving of itself so that irreal objects might give themselves to us. Oh, so receptive. But in the manner of something instituted originally, this transcendence lies in the proper essence of the experience itself. What it signifies can be learned only by interrogating experience, just as what a legal property right signifies and what demonstrated at, demonstrates it at any time can be found out only by going back and examining the primal instituting of that right. So you you got to have your, you got to have your deed. You got to have your, your, um, your, your, yeah, your deed, that you own it, that you own that thing, your, your certificate. Um, yes. The uh, following great and so often neglected truism must therefore be made the center of all investigations of the central sense. Such an affair as an, as an object, even a physical object, draws the untick sense peculiar to it by which it then signifies what it signifies in all possible modes of consciousness, uh, originally from the mental processes of experiences alone. From such processes as are intrinsically characterized as awareness of in the mode itself, it itself, as appearances of a something itself, and in the case of physical objects as are being confronted by something itself, the being of which is certain. The primitive form here is showing itself as present, which belongs to perception, or showing itself again, which belongs to recollection in the mode of the past. Experience is the primal instituting of the being for us of objects as having their objective sense. Um, obviously, that holds good equally in the case of irreal objects, whether their character is the ideality of this specific or the ideality of a judgment or that of a symphony or that of an irreal object of some other kind. There's, there are debates about uh, musical compositions being irreal objects, and whenever you hear a symphony being played, um, you're hearing a reiteration of that ideal song. You go and you hear another symphony play that, you know, or he could be just talking about just uh, the irreal ideal symphony. Anyways, we uh, everywhere and therefore even in the case of external experience, it is true that an evidential giving of something itself must be characterized as a process of constitution, a process whereby the object of experience arises. Though to be sure, this constitution is at first restricted, since the object claims an existence extending beyond the multiplicities of actual present experience. Essentially, in the continuous and discrete synthesis, syntheses of manifold experiences, the experiential object as such is built up visibly in the varying show of their ever new sides, ever new moments belonging to its own essence. And from this consti constitutive life, which predelineates its own possible harmonious flow, the sides and moments and the object itself draw their respective senses, each at the identical that belongs to possible, and after their actualization, repeatable shapings of something itself. Here, too, the identity is evident. The object is evidently not itself the actual and openly possible experiential processes 
constituting it, nor is it the evident possibility connected with this process, the possibility namely of repetitive synthesis as a possibility pertaining to I can. Um, so the object is evidently not itself the actual and open, openly possible experiential processes constituting it. So Husserl wants to say again, to, to tie us back to, to where we started, uh, we don't want to succumb to psychologism when thinking about these propositions. Uh, they are not the um, experiential processes constituting that evidence itself. Even when we explicate our judgments and objectify them so that we might uh, reflect upon them and their adequacy. Um, we are not capturing in that proposition the act of constituting that evidence, of, of having that evidence sit before consciousness. Um, so even if the object that sits before us is a past psychic process, our current psychic process is bringing that past psychic process to the fore as an object for our reflection. Again, does not is not the same thing. You know what is presented is not the the process of of presenting, um, or or receiving in this case because a presentation is not again just something projected from our minds. Presentation is something reciprocal here, which I love. Um, so, in terms of your real objects and their specific type of evidence. You know, that's all I can say for now. Um, you'll have to tune in next time. Well, actually, there won't be another um, uh, public next time for, for this, the, this book, uh, for the LCP Foundation. You'll have to, you'll have to join us uh, in, our, in our discussion or join our study group to um, asynchronously um, review the study guides and um, supplementary material. Or again, you can just reach out and we can we can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion or a whole a whole course charted just for you. Uh, hey, you just let me know. We'll we'll, we'll be around. Um, in the meanwhile, it's late. It's one forty-three a.m. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna end it for now. But I, I want to thank you for having me here. Press subscribe, share, all that good stuff. I'll see you. Later.